please be seated. Well, dear friends in Christ, grace to you in peace. Amen. We're on the second week of, of just kind of a short couple of messages that I'd like to share with you in November before Thanksgiving and Advent and Christmas seasons come crashing in among us. Last week I shared with you a couple of ways in which to connect to God, keep connected to God. When you've lost a sense of spiritual vitality, shared with you that uh, strange story about the floating axe head from 2 Kings, one I've never preached on before, but it was, a, it was just a, a, a one that teaches some spiritual truths about making sure that we're connected with God as we enter into this busiest time of the year. Today I'd like to share some words with you about um, connecting to God when you've kind of lost your sense of purpose. But before we do that, <clears throat> allow me just a moment of personal privilege. My daughters here picked her up at the airport yesterday and, and watched USC and UCLA water polo game yesterday. She has friends on the USC team and, and just then we watched the Ducks game, which was not a good experience. Um, but she's just such a great kid. I'm so, so proud of her. She was here at the first service. She'll be coming um, after uh, this service to, to pick me up. And uh, she's such a great kid. So much fun. So much joy. Um, of my three kids, she's, you know, by all means, my favorite daughter. I know she's my only daughter, but, you know... It's my favorite. She's always been a perfect kid from the time she was small, always just been a perfect, just a perfect kid. Just perfect. <laughs> well, maybe that's stretching it a little bit. There was a time when she was five years old, when she just started using nail polish, and we had just put new carpeting in the house, brand new, fresh clean, fresh, white carpeting in the house. And uh, Laura disappeared after, after dinner one night, and, you, and when you're quiet for 10, 15 minutes, you know you gotta go check them out, and so I did, and, and Laura was sitting in a corner of her bed. Did I say we had put in new, fresh, white carpeting? White, clean, fresh. She was sitting with a bottle of nail polish, empty, because she had poured it out, you know, on a, on a fresh white carpet, just kind of fresh, you know, all over. Other than that, she's just been the perfect kid, and I'm, I'm really, really so proud of her. Have you ever wondered or thought about God being proud of you, about God being a proud Heavenly Father of you? Or... Kind of asked in a little different way, have you, ever, have you ever wondered what you could do to make God proud of you? Or when your name comes across God's mind, when God thinks of Doug or Lois or whoever that might be, that, that it might cause God to smile? Have you ever thought about what would make God proud? You know, we're two centuries removed from the writing of the New Testament, even more than that in the writing of the Old Testament, but throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, there's this personal relationship that, that God has with people and speaks to them and walks and, and, and talks with them, and, and we've kind of lost a sense of that in our intellectualizing of faith and life and our technology and everything, but I, I, think, I think that we've changed. I don't know if God has changed. Do you ever wonder what you could do to make God proud of you. So, the sermon today has to do with connecting God with God when you've lost of your spiritual sense of purpose. And I'd like to suggest that one of the main purposes that we have in life is to live a life that pleases God. To live a life that pleases God. Paul says, live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And now we good Lutherans know that when we live a life that pleases God, that's not going to save us 
We're not saved by what we do, we're saved by what Jesus did on the cross for us. But to strive a life, strive to live a life pleasing God is one thing that I think we're called to do as children of God, children of the Heavenly Father. Now last week I shared with you four ways to connect with God when you've lost a sense of spiritual vitality. And now as we enter into Thanksgiving week, and then the busiest weeks of the, of the entire season, it's easy in these coming weeks to become overburdened, overstressed, overspent, overeaten, and underpurposed. Underpurposed. And so I'd like to share with you four ways to connect with God in times when you find yourself underpurposed or less connected with God than you wish you would be. And for that, I'd like to turn to our first lesson for today, Genesis chapter 6. For the last couple of weeks, I personally have been captivated with Noah. We've been looking at Noah in our Bible study on Wednesdays, and I've been going to the Painted Hills and up on Klein Butte to do some videotaping for that to put it online. Let me suggest from the story of Noah, kind of like I did in the, in the Bible study, that there's four ways to connect with God when you've lost your sense of purpose. First, let's talk about Noah and the reason God chose Noah to build the ark. It starts in Genesis 6, 5, when God says these words. The Lord saw how great our wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Intentionally, every inclination was only evil all the time. The world was filled with people like Gaddafi or Osama bin Laden's or Hitler's. The entire world was evil and the inclinations of their heart, they only wanted to do evil. Not like our world today where I really would like to believe that most people are at least trying to do good. But at Noah's time, it was a world gone bad and out of control. God looks down and thinks, I never should have had those kids. I am so angry with them. And the story would have ended in a great tragedy had it not been for one man, one man and his family who made an incredible difference because he was following God's purpose for his life. So God looks down on creation, saw this mass of sinfulness and rebellion and wickedness and thought about destroying it. But then there comes this one key verse. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. God saw all of these people, every inclination of their heart was evil. Noah found grace and favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's the first time that that word is used in the Old Testament. Here is Noah living in a perverse society, and he's the only one, he and his family, who found grace and favor in the, what? In the eyes of the Lord. End of our lesson for today, the door is read. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. There's way too much to unpack what those words mean, but the first point is, if you want to be connected with God, if you've lost your sense of, of real purpose and meaning in life, first thing, do what Noah did. Noah obeyed. Obey God like Noah did. God said to Noah, I want you to build this ark out of cypress wood with rooms in it, coated with pitch, inside and out, one door to get in and out, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. And Noah obeyed. Chapter 6, 22 says this about Noah building the ark. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Noah obeyed. Noah obeyed what God commanded. I mean, I'd like to get there someday to do everything that God commands me, but Noah was one who obeyed. So the first step in connecting with God when you've kind of lost a sense of purpose is obey. Obey like Noah did. Do everything in your life 
just as God has commanded. And here's the important point. I can't tell you how to do that. I can't tell you how it is for you to obey God in everything that God has, has commanded you. I can't tell you how to do that, but I'll bet that you know ways in which you need to obey God. I'll bet in your life you can identify where you have an obedience deficit, where you obey God 100% in this part, 82%, 76%, 40% in other parts. I can't tell you how to obey God because you probably already know a couple of places in your life when you're not really obeying God and doing what you know God wants you to do. I call that your obedience deficit. And I think if you were to this afternoon think of three areas in your life where you're not obeying God as much as you know God wants you to obey Him. List maybe three things or four, and then write down, this one is really tough. I've tried for years and I just can't do it. This one is a little bit easier. List, list four, and then write them from the easiest to the most difficult. Start with the easiest. If obeying God means coming to church more, being a better spouse, friend, sister, mother, whatever it is, Obey God in that first area, then the second and the third, and by the time you get to the fourth, it'll be much easier than it is right now. Obedience is a choice. It's an individual choice that's different for each one of us. So obey God and overcome that obedience deficit. Second, when you're starting to lose your sense of purpose, trust. Trust God. Noah took his obedience to God and applied it to trusting God. Think of Noah, that had to be a scary moment. He has to go out and catch all of these animals and bring them all into the ark. I mean, quite a job there, whether the animals came themselves or how they got there, we don't know, but it brings these thousands and thousands of animals on the dark and gets in the ark and God shuts the door, the one door. God shuts the door. And then Noah was in the ark for seven days while it just sat there. Just sat there before the rain came. Um, my brother lives out in New Jersey and he and his wife and family were out of electricity for 10 days. I said, well, you know, as I talked to him regularly when he had cell service, so well, how's it going out there? And he said, you know, we played each one of our board games about 27 times by candlelight and it's getting a little bit old. But to sit on the ark for seven days, maybe God was doing something in the heart of Noah, leading him to trust more. When I think of trust, I often think of teaching my kids to jump off a diving board. Remember that, I'd be in the water and I'd say, come on, you, come on, I'm, I'm here, I'll catch you. And they'd kind of walk to the edge and they'd walk back. Sometimes they'd get off, sometimes, but finally, when they got there, they'd you know, stand on the edge of the board and then jump in, and I love that nanosecond. When they're flying through the airs, the air, the most terrified look on their face. Just kind of like, I mean, just every muscle rigid. Come into the water, their head goes under, and when it comes up, boom, talk about a change of expression. I did it, it worked, you were there. Well, I think that's how you learn to trust, by jumping in and giving up control and letting God do what God has promised to do, that is, catch you, prevent you from sinking as you jump into his arms. That's trust. And trusting God is the second part of connecting with God when you've kind of lost that sense of purpose. Third part. Connecting to God is the power of faithfulness. Noah, remember, wasn't on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But when you talk about the week before and the time after, the rains have subsided by the times he sent out the, the raven and then the dove three times. 
Noah was obedient to God in building the ark. He trusted God when God said, go into the ark. And then he was faithful for those 375 days on the ark. And you know what? Faithfulness isn't always fun. Faithfulness is not always fun. Faithfulness is sometimes a real challenge. Just think of Noah, 375 days on that ark, feeding all of those animals, cleaning up after them, you know, with a shovel, and then putting all that stuff over the side of the ark. I mean, talk about no fun at all, but Noah remained faithful, and because he did, God blessed him. Final thing we can learn from Noah is to do what he did when he got off the ark. After he was obedient to God and faithful and trusting, when Noah got off the ark, he built an altar and worshipped God. First thing he does, sacrifice some of these animals and then worshipped God. And God responded to Noah's obedience, trust, faithfulness, and worship by giving a rainbow in the sky. Genesis chapter 9 says, this is a sign of the covenant that I am making between me and you and every living creature with me, with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I'm going to set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign, a covenant between me and you. Whenever the clouds and rainbow appear, I'll remember my covenant and never again will the water destroy all life. The rainbow is a sign of God's promise that God loves to redeem his people and welcome them back. God loves to do things in a different way. So when we're looking at a rainbow after a time of rain, remember that purpose that God has for us and a new and different way to work in us and through us. <clears throat> so in the coming weeks as we enter into this Thanksgiving Advent and Christmas season, into the busiest, stressful time of the year, remember Noah. When you're full up to here with to-do lists, shopping lists, you know you're not going to get it all done in a relaxing kind of way. But when you've lost that sense of purpose and direction, do what Noah did. Obey God. Trust God. Be faithful to God. Worship God. And if you do those four things faithfully, I will bet dollars to donuts, that you'll get to December 26th and say to yourself, best Christmas season ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>